Welcome back to Joy in Our Town, and I'm your host, Mitchell Taylor. And our topic today is substance abuse. And we're talking about what makes an addict. And we're joined today by the author of The Problem Was Me, Thomas Gagliano. Thank you so much for being with us on Joy in Our Town. Thanks for having me. What are, this is a very fascinating subject, not only fascinating because it impacts so many people in our families, um, in our communities, and what are the factors in childhood, I'm trying to get to the genesis, that contribute to addictive thinking? The most important factor is whether or not the child grows up in an addictive household. Uh, if the child uh, learn, is, if a learned behavior is addiction, a way to cope with problems, a way to celebrate victories, if the caregivers or parents are addicts, the child will have this learned behavior that the addiction becomes a solution to life. Uh, it's very important to understand human development, first of all. Children are egocentric. The world revolves around them. If a parent doesn't give a child the proper nurturing or attention, the child doesn't have the ability to say, oh, my, my father or mother or aunt or uncle are busy. Instead, they say, what's wrong with me? I'm defective. I'm not worthy. And if you throw on top of that abuses, uh, physical, mental, sexual abuses, well, there's going to be a real damage there. And that damage it needs to be fixed at some point or there's going to be destructive behavior that follows. Uh, I could tell you for me a little bit about myself and a little bit about my experience with helping many thousands of addicts. Uh, and addicts, when uh, somewhere in their childhood, tough things happen to them. They become legitimate victims. Things happen to them that weren't fair, things they didn't deserve. But they develop this victim mentality, I call it, or this victim role, where they want the world to pay the bill for what happened to them as a child. And when the world doesn't cooperate, they become very angry and they distrust people. People are not really ever going to get close to them. Uh, and from there, a destructive entitlement occurs where they give themselves permission to act in ways, ways where they hurt themselves and others. They really lose empathy for themselves and they lose empathy for others. When these things happen, eventually, they're going to go into isolation and, and really leave, lead a very secluded life. Um, I could tell you for me uh, in childhood, my father was uh, an alcoholic and if he didn't come home at a certain time, it meant he was going to come home drunk. And if he came home drunk, it meant he would hurt someone. <clears throat> so as a kid, I learned these control techniques, characteristics, if you will. I had to make sure that when he came home, my mother was in a safe place, my brothers were in a safe place, I was in a safe place. So control to me as a kid was linked to survival. Mm -hmm. It was very important. As I grew up, control became a character defect. People don't like to be controlled. So what, is, uh, what starts in a childhood as a self-survival technique later becomes a character defect. Many addicts are very selfish people, self-centered. Not because they want to be, because in childhood they developed the characteristic that I need to take care of myself, nobody else will. So they become self-centered. Mm. But it's survival. It's not to hurt others. As they grow older, that selfishness becomes a character defect. People don't like selfish, self-centered people. Wow. But do you see how it starts out from, right. a, from a safety place, yes. but then becomes a character defect? Right. And if they don't work on that, what happens is they're, they're just going to go from one addiction to another. Right. You'll go from alcohol to drugs to gambling and not understand why it happened. When one addiction becomes so unmanageable, that you can't do it anymore. If you don't fix the damage inside, you pop to another one. And that's what a lot of people do. And we know these uh, addicts wear all kinds of masks. There's mm -hmm. actors and actresses, brain surgeons, and there's the people that live on the street, homeless. Right. Right. The right. outsides are all different, but the insides are the same. all the same, a damage inside. Wow. Are there certain instances when addiction intensifies? Uh, yeah, um, one of the uh, uh, time periods where it intensifies is during adolescence. The child, when they uh, uh, become an adolescent, the handcuffs come off. They're, they're able to get to certain things that they couldn't get to his ch in childhood, and that's mm -hmm. when really the freedom gets them in more trouble. Uh, another time that it intensifies is during relationships. You know, we, we know in, in the uh, dictionary, intimacy means closeness, love, warmth. It's right. a very positive 
definition. Right. But not for children that grow, grew up in very tough childhoods. Intimacy to them is fearful, is scary, is something that they want to avoid because they, they've seen that it creates hurt and pain. So as that person gets to become a teenager or early 20s and becomes intimate with people, what also occurs is anxiety builds up, fear builds up, which intensifies the need to go to the substance to ease that fear and ease that pain. Wow. So again, it's the version of intimacy that that child gets is very different from the version of intimacy that, that we know of. And, and the final <clears throat> time I believe it intensifies is during the holidays. Holidays are a wonderful time of the year for many of us, but for some of us, the holidays bring up uncomfortable feelings because we go back to our family of origin and we go back to the roles that we were set up to play by that family. And, and the addictive victim role is just one of many roles that I talk about in my book that wow. come up. Wow. So in your book, good segue, uh, you discuss the roles we set up to play by our childhood messages. I mean, talk a little bit about that. Uh, one of these roles, uh, a role of an addict, yeah, I think addicts play the victim role. They want to blame others, and it gives them the permission then to say, look what this world's doing to me. I can go do these things. I can go drink more, drug more, do these things more. Uh, but there's many different roles. How many of your viewers today uh, are playing the role of the caretaker, where they take the world on their back, mm -hmm. and, and a caretaker doesn't know how to ask for help. When they ask for help, they feel so guilty. Right. Set up by childhood messages. The people pleaser, who says yes all the time because it's too painful to say no. What inner voice or little voice inside of them is telling them that saying no means they're a bad person. Uh, you have a defiant role where people just always want to be different and want to be right. They're the rebels of the world. They want to be right even if it means they push others away. Uh, and then there's the invisible role where people lose themselves in their relationship. They lose their voice, they lose their identity, and they disappear. These are just but some of the roles that are set up by the messages we receive from our higher powers or our, or our caregivers. Wow. Uh, we were talking earlier, and you said that your wife loved the title of your book, The Problem Was Me. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, it, it took time. <laughs> uh, to come up with a name for my book, um, uh, there's a Dr. Abraham Tversky who's also with me on the book. And uh, I had the manuscript all set and I couldn't come up with a name. And every time I would walk in and, and give her a name, she would do this kind of uh, <laughs> posture, if you will. And I finally, one night, I said, I got it. The problem was me. And I walked into the bedroom. I said, Sue, the problem was me. And she said, you got that right. And that's how I came to name the book, The Problem Was Me. So what was your aha moment in life? I mean, obviously you have a testimony that you could share with the millions of viewers that are looking and seeing you today. What was your aha moment? I believe it happened uh, with my father in, in the hospital. Uh, I didn't have a great relationship with my father, uh, and, but he became a different person. He went into recovery, he went into uh, retreats. He, he became just a, a good person, a great grandfather to my children, loving grandfather. But to me, I had a lot of problems with him. And, and I went to visit him one night in the hospital. He, he had stomach cancer. He was very ill. Mm. And the cancer had spread all over, and he was all hooked up. And I went to see him one night. And as we spoke, I got up to leave. And he said, Tommy, sit down here. I want to tell you something. He says, you know, my father was dying of, of lung cancer 20 years ago. I, I never was able to tell my father that I loved him. I was never able to tell my father that I cared. And he says, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to live with that pain. And you know, my father was able to see my pain, even with the pain that he was going through at the time. And when I got up from the hospital, that, the chair that day, I went to touch his hand to say goodbye. And he, he grabbed me and he pulled me close and he started to cry. And I had never seen my father cry. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. The only time I saw my father cry is when he was drunk and he would hurt us. And then he would ask for forgiveness in a mm. crying, drunken mode. Mm. But these were sincere tears. Mm. And as I, I remember leaving the hospital room uh, feeling distraught, um, I started to communicate with him more. He died about two weeks later, and my mother had given me uh, this book with his journals in it. And I was reading the journals, this is after he passed away, and I started to see that my father wasn't a 10-foot monster. You know, he was a guy like myself, full of fears, full of destructive inner messages from his childhood. He was me and I was him, really. And, mm. and I think that that really freed me from so much of the self-hate I had for myself that I threw onto him. And, and when, that, when it freed me, I really went into helping other people, 
first I worked on my damage, as I said earlier. I had to do that. I had to find out what was broken inside of me in order to know what had to be fixed. And then I started to work on my damage. But I think that moment really, he freed me. He freed me from a lot of the self-hate I had for myself. So Now, do you, uh, did you have a substance abuse challenge yourself? Not me. I was a uh, womanizer, compulsive gambler, compulsive worker. My father and my, uh, my brothers have substance abuse problems. I, the reason why I believe I never did is because I hated alcohol so much as a kid. I used to flush the bottles all down the sink every day that I looked at alcohol with such hatred that I would never drink. So instead, unfortunately, not fixing the damage, I found some other way to act out my feelings. And would you say that, based on the other question I asked you about addiction and the genesis of addiction, would you say that because addiction was prevalent in your family construct that it was, you were trending towards some form of addiction, and is that common? Very common. Again, it's a learning behavior. You know, if mom and dad use addiction as a way to cope with life's problems, or even celebrate good times, you know, the child is going to learn that behavior and go in that direction much easier than if it wasn't there. I got you. So how do you help others? Well, when I started to fix that damage, I started to run groups in churches and schools in my house free of charge. And what I did is I started with the destructive messages. What were the messages in your life that led you to act out in destructive ways? Let's get rid of them. Let's bring them to the light and expose them. So I, uh, I did this in groups, uh, and I call this inner critic the warden. It's that little voice inside of us that we all have to some extent constantly knocking us down, telling us that we can't allow people close to us. We sabotage our relationships. We're not allowed to stumble in life. We're not allowed to make a mistake. If we make a mistake, we are a mistake. Mm. We got to get rid of that voice by bringing it to the surface. So awareness is the first step. And, and, and after that, I later went back to school uh, graduated uh, a couple of years ago uh, with my master's at Rutgers. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, my book came out, and now I do this. I run groups, uh, do consulting to marriages so that they can give their children some of the positive messages that might have been denied to them. Right, uh, right. And I do this individually, too. Wow. Um, there's a, a fictitious character that you call Warden. Right. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. You know, the Warden gets uh, created in a destructive childhood mm. in a belief system where the person believes that they're, they're, they're not, as I said, they're not allowed to stumble in life. Mm -hmm. uh, a warden is that inner critic that just beats the person down. Oh. Uh, and, and if you don't expose that inner critic, it will guide you towards destructive actions. So what I do talk about in my book is my life story and the story of other people that uh, in my groups have exposed that inner critic so they could stop listening to that warden's commands and be who they want to be, not who wow. they were set up to be. And wow. that's really the big message in my book. Now, you know, I, when I was reading that, I was, I was, I was intrigued because it almost um, looks like the perfectionist complex. The perfectionist complex, and I know you know about that, you never satisfy yourself. You know, when you go up to the next round, you're not high enough. You got to exactly. keep going higher and higher and higher. And that is one of the roles, a perfectionist role. You know, those are the individuals that sometimes don't try in life because they feel if they can't be perfect, they can't do it at all. Why even try? Uh, and yeah, um, I had some of that role. Uh, these roles, you could be a mixture of a few. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the perfectionist role is, uh, what if I stumble? What if I make a mistake? Right, right. And, uh, and at the end of the day, a perfectionist will only think about all they've done wrong they won't celebrate what they've done right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the warden again, telling right. you all the things you've done wrong. Wow. Well, we got about a minute left, and there's about three million people looking at us right now. I want you to look into your camera, and I want you to talk to some people that may be struggling with how to help someone that's addicted. They don't maybe not know how to approach them and, you know, tell them they need help. Maybe you can give them some basic tenets that might help them get through this initial introduction to this nuance of addiction in their family? Well, first of all, become aware of your shortcomings. It's hard to help our children or others out if we're not working on our character defects. And when you go to change actions in your life, it becomes a we process, not a me process. Solicit the help of others. Those in your life that are loving people, don't solicit the help of those that are going to judge you or make you feel worse. But go to people that you're safe with, people that you know are there for you. 
Uh, and, and the last uh, tip is maintain those different actions. Because as I say in my book, if you don't, that warden's gonna come back and tell you what to do again. And, and you don't want that to happen. So allow others to help you, those loving and trusting people in your life that, uh, that you know are there for you. Tom, thank you so much. You're I welcome. know many people were helped by this, this interview on today. So thank you for being a, 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 a great contributor. Thank you, Richard. Join our town. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Okay. Join our town. By your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.